reference I give in Henry Ford as a staff, potentially. So I'm going to talk about pulmonary hypertension. This is a pulmonary conference, so I'm going to try to speak more about what we usually talk when you guys do the pH rotation as well. So you know my disclosures are there. Henry Ford receives money, very important, it's not me. So we're going to talk about some of the facts in pulmonary hypertension, a little bit of history, what is what is pulmonary hypertension, some of the basic things that we normally talk about pulmonary hypertension when you guys rotate with me, some treatment choices and algorithm, some facts about transplant and pulmonary hypertension, some of the most common conditions that we see in pulmonary hypertension, and some of the future directions. I really want you guys to stop me if there is any question. You know, this is the moment, Sir Rafael, not the elevator. <laughs> Uh, which you had answered. So just so you know, he used to make it public. He did ask us in the elevator, how do we treat RV failure in the ICU? And we only had from the 17th floor to the first floor to respond. So you had one hour now. <laughs> this is actually the hemodynamic definition of pulmonary hypertension that actually was brought up by um, Paul Wood. This is where Wood's unit come from. This is the guy who actually put the name to that because he defined the pulmonary hypertension, he defined the PA pressure more than 30 over 15 with a mean more than 20, and he said normal PBI less than one unit, which was then practiced as his name after. But obviously he was close, not exactly what we call pulmonary hypertension now, which we know pulmonary hypertension implies that you have a mean pulmonary pressure more than 25. This is, everybody knows this already in this room. PAH means that, but you don't have evidence that your left side of the heart is giving you problems. But you remember, anything else can actually increase your pulmonary artery pressure mean. If you don't have left heart, you can still have that, and it's not PAA. She just gave you an example of COPD doing that. So you remember that. That's why you got some percentage of you got it wrong, because that can increase your pulmonary pressure and keep in a normal wedge. So in some of the institutions, like the American College of Cardiology Foundation, they decide to include PBR. I think we use PBR mostly for patients with liver disease who need to be transplanted. Mike went through this, and I really don't plan on going in detail on this. The most important thing that I want to mention on this is this is the classification that we use, and I feel happier and happier every time that I see patients on the floors and I see the residents writing patient belongs to group this, this, and that. That means that really is sinking in the brain of people from residency to fellowship. So it is understood, and when you put this type of classification numbers, it implies treatment choices. That's what the main things are. It implies prognosis as well. So what we, what every pulmonary hypertension program in the world wants to see is this. Group one, those are the fun things that happen to actually be treated with the fancy medicines we use. But when, and we end up seeing this and this, for the most part. So that's our uh, the pulmonary hypertension practice is. Is this a reality in the world? No, it's not. The reality is you have a little bit of this with a little bit of that, with a little bit of this, with a little bit of this. And at the end of the day, we always come to the conclusion, it is a mixture of disease. Now we see much more of different spectrum of conditions and things are gonna be evolving more and more. So I'm just gonna go a little bit through some of the histology, pathology problems that happen at the molecular level. So there is an element of vasoconstriction, elements of endothelium one that are increased in the endothelium. So we always blame the capillary and we always blame that everything can happen around this. Not necessarily, more and more information is coming up now. And even if there is a study in COPD showing that even the bronchioles get affected in case of pulmonary hypertension. It is evolving so much. But the, what we know now is the endothelial uh, layer and the capillary itself is very affected. Prostaglandins, nitric oxide, and uh, um, one eight cyclase axis, potassium and calcium channels, those are the classic elements that have been targeted for treatment choices. There is significant amount of cell proliferation and apoptosis with the vasoconstrictor, some of those that I mentioned already. Growth factors have been very much implied on this. I don't think you need to know any of this, but often they like to ask a little bit of basic science in boards. So you have to have an idea what of these things could be implicated in the development of pulmonary hypertension. Proteases and elastases, 
TTR gamma, mitochondrial dysfunction, and some transcription factors that have been discovered to play a role, particularly in mutation in the background of pulmonary hypertension. This is a big field now being studied that the degree of inflammation that is being noted in patients with pulmonary hypertension with motocyte, macrophage, dendritic cell, T and C bell lymphocyte recruitment, and cytokines that are elevated significantly in some of these patients as well. So obviously this is just more than what we used to think it was this. This is what people was hanging on most of the time. So this has evolved very much so. Angiogenesis, vessels are starting to become more, not just the ones that we have and get constricted. We're getting endothelial cells, uh, progenitor cells in the circulation as well, and trying to replace the disease ones, and we're seeing that as a part of the pathophysiology of angiogenesis in this particular group of patients. We always talk about anticoagulation in patients with pulmonary hypertension, so they do have some degree of thrombogenic state, particularly in the small vessel area. And also a newer type of approach is metabolic changes. So the, uh, these patients do have altered estrogen levels, hypertension, glucose tolerance. At the level of the cellular level, they have also changes in the glycolytic pathway that has been discovered more recently as well. So as you can see, there's a lot of stuff that is being studied in regards to pathogenesis of pulmonary hypertension. And I wanted to mention this as well because I don't know how many of you have ever heard about epigenetic changes. Does anybody know what that means, epigenetic changes? It sounds like a different world for the Henry Ford population because we don't do basic sciences, but it has to be heard sometimes in your brain. Uh, epigenetic means that now we're seeing, and that has been described for more than five years or so, that we're seeing changes in the DNA structure by methylation of some of the bases in the DNA structure of a patient or a person that is not abstract, exact translation of the DNA that you expect to have. You get a base or a couple of bases that end up being methylated and then they get transcribed without changes in the DNA. So that old thought that you have to have a mutation in anybody because you have to have a genetic abnormality like the BNPR mutation is valid, but it's not what happens to most of them. Otherwise, how do you ex explain? Yes, you can explain that genetically susceptible would be PMPR mutation, AKI with one mutation that we know already, that they develop pulmonary <coughs> hypertension if you give them any head with these uh, insider factors. But then how do you explain to me, for example, that only 6% of cirrhotic patients report a hypertension develop pulmonary hypertension? Why not everybody? Why only 4% of COPD develop severe pulmonary hypertension and not everyone, if they have the same stimulus? So this is becoming bigger now because they are seeing now there are more definition of changes by methylation mostly of bases in the DNA that don't cause translation. And this is just one part because then you go into the world of microRNAs. But those are words that you're going to hear very much so in the basic science world in pulmonary hypertension, and actually this goes to cancer and this goes to other proliferative diseases. MicroRNAs are RNAs actually that are not actually of the significant size considered to be one of the RNAs to be translated as well, but they end up actually stimulating translation. And this is something that is not easy to detect. So I'm gonna move into therapy options and consideration, and I'm gonna put a case. These my cases are not as good as Max. But we have a 62-year-old woman with EAH scleroderma admitted to the ICU with the following hemodynamic profile. Naive to therapy, these are her CAT numbers, right? Atrial pressure of 23, right ventricular pressure 78 over 35, pulmonary artery pressure 82 over 43, mean of 55, 56, weight of 14, output 2.5, index 1.3. The current best evidence for treatment of this patient is Triple combination therapy with an endotelium receptor antagonist, PDE5, and prostacycline analog. Initiation of continuous intravenous infoprostenol. Cell cell 500 milligrams two times a day, plus prednisone one milligram per kilogram. Start both symptoms at low dose, and in one month you increase, and then you add sildenafil. So who wants, uh, Surafel has to be you. <laughs> yeah. What is your answer here? Uh, I need infoprostenol. Okay, so current best evidence, patient in failure, class four in the hospital, in the ICU. This is a bold question. I had it in the last time that I read it. So they're gonna ask you not more than that. But 
So the answer is definitely, so Rafael, you're gonna get it right. So initiation of continuous intravenous lymphoprostin. So the evidence-based treatment algorithm for PAH patient is complicated. We have headaches on what to give to anyone, but guess what? They are gonna ask you this, because this is the only situation that you have a single medicine in a box. There is a 1-8 recommendation. WHO functional class four. If I want you guys to go with something in your brain, this, for treatment choices. Then you start into muddy waters here. There's too much stuff that you can give. Too many medications, and the, the, the intention of my conversation is not to talk about the medications themselves. It's just to talk to you about the main indication when they are very sick, hypoprostone or IV continues to sit there. This is uh, still out of 2013 in the NICE conference. Then it was added initial combination therapy. This is still in the process of being studied. There was just one trial release showing the combination therapy works for two medications, and present and Dilavacu, but some of the other ones have not been as fruitful. The one that is actually best is sildenafil plus hypoprostenol in sick patients. But anyway, at the end of the day, you are gonna determine if the patient has inadequate clinical response, and you're gonna consider eligibility for lung transplantation. If the patient, this is even despite you do combination therapy, on maximal therapy, you can do atrial septostomy, but at the end of the day, you have to always be conscious that transplantation could be the answer for that particular patient. The ones in yellow here, Massitentan and Ipoprostol, are the only two medications in prospective randomized trials shown to have a mortality benefit. So it may be a both question that which one of those by evidence show mortality benefit, Ipoprostol and Massitentan, which is a tissue-specific endotelium receptor antagonist. So when we look at all this, I mean, the fact that I told you that there is only two medicines that show mortality benefit, that doesn't mean that medicines don't work in mortality. So this is actually a meta-analysis that is, again, in a retrospective manner, of course, because it's meta-analysis, and it, it, it comes up to be about 3,000 patients in all the trials of different things, prostacycline analogs, endothelium receptor antagonists, phosphodiesterase inhibitors, and some others, when you put it together, actually favors treatment. And this was a well-done analysis. And at the end, what is interpreted is you have an overall reduction in mortality of about 44% compared to control group. <coughs> so all of them do show some of this. So it's still, since many of these trials were done with medications just to see how much the patient walks more, six minute walk distance. Some parameters that in the past, it was actually for the pharmaceutical company to get the medicine approved by FDA and to make money. That was the purpose. Then the purpose is changing. We don't do six minute walk test trial now, so we're doing time to clinical worsening, mortality, but for that you need big numbers of patients. So many of these studies were based in parameters that had some correlation to mortality, but it wasn't a direct linear correlation like a six minute walk distance. But at the end of the day, yes, if they don't, they do help. We see it, we see it every day. Uh, in this patient, how we get there. However, it's not ideal. And if we compare the reveal registry, which is the largest uh, collection of patients, 20, about 2,800 patients, there was a registry of all patients who have had prevalent and incident pulmonary hypertension, and they were studied to see how they have done compared to the NIH registry, which is the equation that was done in 1983 that actually told us what was the mortality in the natural history of the disease, which is that this is what it is, at different years and survival. So this is where we are now, as of the review registry that was actually uh, published 2010. So we are not doing that great, and this disease continues to be bad. That's all I wanna show you, that still we have survival rates uh, worse than many cancers that we already have. And you know, when we have these patients that are young, you have to start talking to them, you have to give them hope. You have to say, okay, we're gonna make you better. But at the end of the day, we know that they are not gonna have a normal lifespan. Yes? Are these all PAH patients yeah. or all PAH? No, PAH, this is just PAH cases. Good question, because when you talk about PH, and I will show you with other groups, for any time that you add PH to someone, you definitely decrease survival in almost anything else. Would it be to this extent? I'm clear, because I wouldn't say the same about COP, which is different as well. So how do we treat these patients? Monotherapy, so we give one pill or one treatment at a time. Sequential salvage therapy, addition of a second or third drug due to clinical worsening that we determine by our parameters. Treat to goal therapy, that I explain in a second. Preemptive combination therapy, would you give many more, more than one medicine to a patient? Still, 
and known if that's the best way to do it. Or sequential monotherapy, you get rid of one medicine before you start the next one. This is basically not used uh, in the majority of the clinical practices, but then these are some of the questions, and my lecture is about what are the controversy because everybody does work different. If you go to different centers, you're gonna find somebody who likes one drug and they sit on them for a while. Somebody will do this. We tend to do this in this institution because we find that actually gives us a better outcomes. We are more aggressive, that's for sure. And this is what we follow, and this is what we see when I have you guys see patients follow up. Some of you may say, why do you want to see follow up patients in the pulmonary hypertension clinic? Because you have to learn this. You have to learn this as the best evidence so far that we want these patients to get back to functional class one and two. You want the hemodynamics to be normalized, at least to have a right atrial pressure less than eight, which means that you have a functional right atrium still that is not loaded and done. Cardiac index more than three. E echocardiogram that normalizes RV size and function. This is a difficult goal, but this is not. We see this, sometimes we see dilated RVs, but we see normal function still. BMP less than 50, that's what we consider normal. Six minute walk test between 380 and 440, and parameters of cardiopulmonary exercise test that I can have Sacramores have a seizure right now because <laughs> VE, VCO2 at anaerobic pressure less than 45 is a goal, and I do agree with him very much so that the ventilator equivalence at 45 is somebody that is in the brink of death. I mean, this is very, very sick people. So if you make this a goal, you are asking for two, two I mean, too little to get to that point. So it shouldn't be that much. Big deal, two more than 15. So there is some discrepancy here because by the point you get here, this definitely is lower than that. So we tend to see it much lower than that. Considerations on this. Treatment algorithm only applies to WHO group one. Treatments have been evaluated by RCTs, mainly in IPAH, heritable, and norexidine induced connective tissue disease and congenital heart disease. As head-to-head -head comparison among different compounds are not available, no evidence-based first-line treatment can be proposed except for what I mentioned in the question before. Other than that, there is no way that I can tell you Bocentan is better than Ambricentan, Ambricentan is better than Macitentan, so that doesn't exist. Let's switch gears to lung transplantation and pH, and that will be as quick as I can be, but let's put this case. 55-year-old woman, eight years on epoprostenol therapy, 25 nanograms per kilogram per minute, continues, of course, five years on both center and sildenafil for IPH. Functional uh, class uh, four for the last three months, and that's the hemodynamic <coughs> profile that you guys can read. Obviously, very high pulmonary pressure, horrible right atrial pressure, wedge continues to be normal, cardiac index um, output uh, suboptimal with a high PVR. Uh, it moves, okay? It's a bad direction. So, what do you guys are gonna do? What is her best option at this time? Palliative medicine consultation, transition to intravenous remodeling, goal 40 nanogram per kilogram per minute. Add what in incremental doses as tolerated. Atrial septostomy, initiate workup for lung transplantation. Brian, you are in PH, you gotta answer this one. <laughs> And we're talking about transplantation. So, but now explain to me why not four? Well, well, different oxygen. Can we go back to the previous slide? Yeah. Sure. Maybe that's what I wonder is that with the um, atrial pressure being that high. Okay, high. so you're talking about a right atrium that is already long. You decompress that right atrium and the mortality in the cat lab is more than 20% just to attempt to do that. So actually it is a contraindication. Why not add reosiguant? Julio. That was the other question there. So he doesn't know. Uh, what do you think? Yeah. Wake up. Why wouldn't you add reosiguant to this patient? That's good, it's good that you are not sure because I want you to be sure. Surapel, sorry. Uh, I guess that's, that's a cool one for CPPH. I don't know if it's been high in the past. Okay. Um, Jenny. Okay. How many of you are mostly awake? Mohana. Or are you going to see a group of them? Okay. Uh, can anybody give me an answer on this one? 
that doesn't exist, I guess. Is it because he's already on Soldenafil, and so we're already targeting the nitric oxide pathway? That is very correct, because you don't combine two medicines of the same category. And actually, we all see what continues considered to be of the same category of a nitric oxide stimulator and actually enhancer as well. It's a different pathway than it's, it's, it's not um, a PDE5, but it's the same thing. But it's important that you know this because I don't want you to recommend anywhere else, wherever you go, what to this patient. And that exists. It will be in the formulary eventually. And yes, it's not a chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, but what was also approved. The same issue of New England Journal of Medicine demonstrated the effect in IPH with CTPH as well. Two, there were two different papers. So, palliative medicine consultation, she's young. She could be transplanted, but again, again, that could be happening. So why don't we transition to intravenous remodeling and go and put it to 40? Rodeo. She's already on hypoprostenol. She's already on hypoprostenol, but it has not been studied in hypoprostenol or remodeling. They haven't been studied back to back, and it would, it would potentially give any uh, potential benefit, benefit after that. Okay, so Ryan, you were correct. But look at this. This is the long allocation score calculator. This is what the nurse <laughs> practitioners and the nurses from the transplant team plug in there to allocate the, or give a number to see what is going to be the chances for these patients to be transplanted, right? So high weight, lung diagnosis code, functional status, diabetes, assisted ventilation, Requires supplemental oxygen, amount, percent predicted LDC, pulmonary artery systolic pressure, mean pulmonary artery pressure, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and gases parameters, sigminal walk distance, and serum creatinine. I highlighted in red what could be of significance for a pulmonary hypertension patient. And the majority, actually, of, of the parameters they put into the lung allocation score are not pertinent to pulmonary vascular disease. And the ones actually, this is just to plug into a formula that is humongous that I had a chance to study and is absolutely out of control. Every disease has a coefficient of factor that you multiply by, and every one of these has a coefficient of factor that gets multiplied by to get into that number that you finally say uh, that they have a 30, a 40, a 50, or 60 of AMS. So pulmonary hypertension, it is a condition that is disadvantaged by transplantation. And this is was actually exemplified by this study uh, published in 2009, that is the wait list outcomes of IPAH compared to other diagnoses. And this is pre long allocation score, post long allocation score, the percentage of patient transplant, transplanted here. We see that there is a big difference. They get more transplanted patients with IPF, IPAH, or COPD and cystic fibrosis. There is a, clinical, a significant statistical significance of transplant. But look at the depth with the waiting list outcomes for IPAH, there is no difference before and after, while there is a difference for other diagnoses. And that is continues to be demonstrated as we see now. Look, some of you during your three years of training have seen my patients die because they don't get transplanted because their scores are not very high. They get in the 30s, 40s, when they are actually really bad in that. And so David, is it because our medical treatment has improved as well? No, absolutely. Medical treatment would sort of make these people survive. They would make them live longer. But when they reach transplantation time, this is what we're talking about. At the moment that they reach transplantation, they are in disadvantage. And even though, if, when you compare disease versus disease here, with the wait list outcomes as well, there is a difference compared to IPF. So in the pre-LAS score, there was a difference, continues to be even a more marked difference in regards of tra transplantation. So IP IPF gets more transplanted. There is no difference with COPD. You know COPD now doesn't get as transplanted as IPF. Versus CF, there is a clear difference which existed before, but that definitely is a difference between diseases such as COPD, IPH, IPH versus cystic fibrosis. So wait list is still bad. So you can do an appeal criteria that you can say that the patient will be jumped to the 90th percentile if they satisfy all of the following criteria, the deteriorating of optimal medical therapy, radical pressure greater than 15, or cardiac index less than 1.8. So this applies to IPAH. This doesn't apply to other diseases that get transplanted, and you plug this on top of that. So again, when you get to this point, then you can actually get that advantage. And the LAS score is being revised, um, uh, or is considered to be revised to give a better benefit to uh, PAH cases. 
when you look at that, and this is another reason why people are nervous about it, because when you look at this graph, it's a classic graph shown by transplant people, survival in years in different diseases process, IPAS is a yellow one, look where it goes. Survival after transplantation is lower, so these patients actually don't do as good compared to, and then when you see that medium survival, alpha 1, 6.3 years, CF 7.8, always the best, COPD 5, IPAH 5.2, it, it may not be that significant at the end, but there is a clear, clear difference here at the beginning. When you adjust conditional to the, first, to the patient lived the first year, within these years, you can see actually the patient with pulmonary hypertension, they go par with CF. So they actually do achieve a better survival after that. As soon as you jump the first year after transfer, these patients will be okay. And why? Probably because they are young. Most of these patients are younger compared to the others, and the others start taking a hit. Patients with COPD and IPF, which tends to be older. So this is important to know because at this point, uh, patients with pulmonary hypertension have a median survival of 10 years after transplantation. So if you are able to jump that, and that has to do a lot with the experience of the transplant center with that first year of treatment after transplant. Do we think that the reason they have a higher mortality that first year is because of the time it takes for their RVs to recover? It's that, because they have definitely more, much more uh, allograft uh, dysfunction. Definitely, they do have more problems dealing with the fluids, at the, at the exchange of fluids. So they definitely do have not rejection, it's not rejection based. It's most graft dysfunction because of that fluid issues. Victor, is that statistically significant in that group in that first year when they have that degree being lower? Is it, is. it is. It is. It is. And okay. that's why the, the transplant surgeons, they see pH and they don't like it. They, they really don't go happy, but you know, they have to be transplanted. So what are the controversies they prefer for transplant? Not appropriately prioritized by ALS. Uh, we talked about it. PFT is usually normal in these patients, a little bit of infusion problems. Measures of RV function are not considered yet, like Max mentioned TAPSI, right? TAPSI is nowhere there in the LAS score, so eventually it will be. Mortality in the waiting list is still an issue, and revision is happening. Left heart disease, that's a bigger problem. So we have a 60-year-old woman referred by the Internal Medicine Service for evaluation of shortness of breath and lower extremity edema for two and a half years. Cardiology consultant stated that her problem is mostly from her lungs. I think you get some of those sacs, right? You're staring at All the time. Past medical history, diabetes, hypertension, AFib, coronary artery disease, with some fixing of that before. Physical exam, you see it there. Common, BMI of 52. JVD 14, loud B2 sound, irregular rhythm, shallow breaths, um, with normal sounds, and there is a good amount of edema in that patient. So not very different to what we really see in clinical practice all the time. So she has a right hand cat, again that moves and it shows that this actually bumps a little bit into the IV. Right atrial pressure 14, right ventricular pressure 64, mean uh, 32, PA mean 50, pretty elevated, wedge of 23, cardiac capital of 4.8, index of two, PVR of 5.6. Look warm stuff, right? I mean, this is bad. But then, eh, bad. But we see it all the time. So we are desensitized by numbers, by the way, in this hospital. We see huge numbers and say, hey, it's okay. In other places, they panic with these numbers. Cardiac of 4.8, cardiac index of 2. And again, this is a resting test. So, what is the best for this patient? Increment pyrosamide with additional 40 milligrams daily to the current dose. Add sildenafil 20 milligrams three times a day and increment to 40 milligrams three times a day in three weeks. Initiate hypoprostenol, 2 nanograms per kilogram per minute. Perform gastric bypass surgery after well diarrhea, and refer to pH heart failure specialist for trial inclusion. This is the easiest thing. Jackie? pH is not my strong point in this case yet. I know, um, I see you, but. I <laughs> but what do you think if you are a good test taker? So she came in with RV strain, volume overload. Um, you're, say, you're an advantage being in the ICU with this patient. I would, I would say at least six, <laughs> I guess. But I feel like that's going to be wrong. That's okay. It's, no, it's okay to be wrong. That's what we want this. Yeah. Be wrong now, <laughs> not to be wrong later. Do you want to point a friend? Yes. Surafan? Sure. <laughs> Surafan. <laughs> okay, Surafan wants to diarrhea the patient. All right. Who agrees with Surafan? 
the wedge is high, so. Yeah. Okay. So you're gonna diarrhea the patient. Yes, the patient is gonna come back to you in three months again, swollen again. Could you give us a blood pressure? Please. Yeah. Yeah. Well, right. Well, then we yeah. bring him back sooner. Yeah. That's right. Slightly <laughs> 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 sooner. Why don't the dogs should like a more gastric bypass to like, make loss after the urease? Is it the most basic step by Basically, the message I want to pass to you all <laughs> is I know what to do with this patient for the long term benefit of this case. Everything that is mentioned here, this is temporary. You temporize the patient. The patient still has a rate, mean point of pressure of 50. And a cardiac output that is already going down. So if you're going to diarrhea this patient, you're going to maintain it, okay, maybe for the next six months, and then you're going to see the patient is going to continue to go down because that's what these patients do. And in sildenafil, there's not enough evidence that really works for these patients yet. Right? It's strong enough. You don't initiate it for personal because you have a high weight, right? I mean, this is not group one disease, it's group two. You are not going to guide pulmonary hypertension is an absolute contraindication for gastric bypass surgery, so you know that. So the answer is that for trial inclusion theoretically. So that's why because normally when nothing else fits, usually it tends to be. Yeah. You can't consult with that speaking. <laughs> <laughs> that's another thing. Oh, no, that's quite the answer. You guys should be getting half my patients out of stroke and right? so you know I, I really think you if I agree with Sarah, I think you diarrhea this patient and you watch really closely. You know, not three months later. So a lot of these patients, I don't think, deteriorate to the point they have to send you. They, they get better and stay good and just keep them dry. If, if everybody, if the question. If, it, if yeah. everybody would be as good as you and that. Sarah to monitor these patients, I would believe you. But the data shows that these patients have a significant increment in mortality compared to the patients who don't have pulmonary hypertension in the background of heart failure with pressure reduction fraction. And these patients actually do, do, do worse because they are never diarrhea to that good level. And we see that in daily practice. Daily diuresis is based on, on how they look. It's so different to when you cut this patient and you find a high watch. How many times are you gonna be cutting this patient? At the end of the day, the temporizing right answer, if I would say for a temporary relief, absolutely, I would diarrhea, and we will diarrhea this patient, no question about it. But this patient, pulmonary hypertension and right ventricular failure, as I will show you, it will actually make this patient die sooner than anybody else without pulmonary hypertension the same degree of left heart failure. So, what, so other than adding lasers on, on this specific patient, what is the pH specialist going to do more? Because you're fighting for it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 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 At the end of the day, let me tell you, yeah. how many, you were with me in pulmonary hypertension, I mean the days that you were awake. Um, <laughs> in those days, you realize that it's very, very common that we get these patients fluid overloaded uh, to the point that they didn't want to die with them anymore. There is we what? diary 70 liters. 79 today. Oh, Miss Baker? Yeah, yeah. 79 so liters. And 79 liters. Look at Miss Hayes. I'm 79 sorry, this is HIPAA protected. We're in a room. But she's on F2, and we have the woman, is just she has edema all the way to the back, to the shoulders. So, not that we're better at diuresis, we're more conscious about what can happen. And, and yet, there is no solution, Mohammed. The answer is that there is no. So this solution. should be patient should be diaries on your own, or e diary send send you diaries. But I think, I think the other. Let's go back to the numbers. Wasn't part of the point of the numbers here is that there was for the patient had an elevated wedge and an elevated diastolic gradient, and so it was needs diaries down to a dry weight and then see what. This is overthinking the question. Okay. <laughs> that's what, that's exactly, that's... But that's what your numbers show. Yeah, exactly. I, mean, I think there's more to it than that, Hector, too. I mean, rather than put somebody on a yeah, gazillion yeah. dollar medication, you not only die reese, but you after a little reducing, you feel reducing, do all those other important things to, to yeah, pre and after load along with the laces, you know? You know, I think, again, you're a very smart pulmonologist. I think that you are just not the typical treat, treatment choice for a patient like this. This is a very prevalent condition, and nobody does that. Pulmonary spread... It's just systemic blood pressure. This patient has a heart failure with pressure rejection fraction. These patients do have blood pressure of 140, 150 by the primary care physician. said, that's fine. That's mm -hmm. perfectly fine. And they are swollen and they are being told, no, I'm, uh, you are fine. I mean, we had a patient like barking at us. I mean, they, they didn't want the, the patient to go back to a private doctor because they are saying, this, they are not doing anything for me and the, and the swelling is there. So again, yes, it may not be a fair question. Don't overthink it because there is not really a good answer for this particular okay, case. Before you move on, sure. can you go back to the original patient thing? The first one. So in this case, would you not ex would you or would you not expect your cardiologist to put this patient on 
metroprusside or something in the cath lab to remeasure the pulmonary uh, the pulmonary pressures to see what happens when you drop the blood pressure because I've had two cases with you guys that when they do that magically the numbers look much better. And um, they can. And they absolutely can. The problem is that in order for that to happen, you need to have somebody who is doing the and he's thinking through it. And it doesn't happen all the time. So that's why in, in the in pulmonary hypertension centers, you actually have to give the particular instruction sometimes to spell it out. If you see hypertension, bring the blood pressure down in this case. So that's not uniformly done. Not at all. I wish that would be the case, but it's absolutely not. But it's good that we have this discussion because this is what we face every day in the clinic. Right, Jenny? Thank you. So again, this is just to exemplify in a single echo lab in an Australian community of this amount of people, and they found that 78% of the patients who had pulmonary hypertension turned out to have their heart disease. We know it's the most prevalent thing. No brainer on this one, because we have more than heart disease. Now the comorbidities, we know by the review registry in patients with idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, half, a third of them are obese, hypertension in 40%, ischemic cardiovascular events in this category, and just go on in this, and particularly the age 50 plus females for most part still, and what is telling me that you are gonna find comorbidities mostly with diastolic heart disease because that's where these people are gonna go as well, even if they have IPA, so it adds confusion. Just to compare to what they are seeing in China, which is what they used to see in the US in the 80s, or closer to that, particularly the age, and much less of the comorbid conditions that is being discussed. So this is the problem here, Zach, because some of these patients they have a spectrum of RV dysfunction and presentation. So in patients who have left heart disease, most of these patients stay there. The majority theoretically stay in this way. So you have, um, correct, sorry, this way, because left ventricular dysfunction, so the mortality is lower. The treatment is treat myocardial disease. Lots of studies, the cardiologists know what to do with this patient. However, these patients who go into more severe right ventricular dysfunction, the mortality is higher. The treatment are not accepted yet. If anything is valid for to treat these patients, so we are still fighting with these patients. These patients get on sildenafil all the time. Sometimes they get decompensated for that reason. Even to diagnose these patients is complicated, and this is just to tell you about almost 12,000 cases that were looked at in uh, University of Pennsylvania. Retro again, retrospective, they look at this left and right heart cats with correlation of wedge pressure and LVEDP. You would expect a linear correlation, which most of them are linear, but look at the big number of patients who have an elevated LVEDP and a wedge less than 15. On the same or the other way around, you have a very high wedge pressure and your LVEDP is low. This is all measurement error that occurs in these patients and we see it every day. Constantly we have to go, let's go and look at the tracings to see what they look like. Even in the ICU, you see how many times we modify the tracings were not correct. So it gives you a, a lot to think about what you are getting in those procedures. And this is the University of Pennsylvania with one of the largest PA programs too. So out of proportionality, so what candidates, so what do we use to decide somebody has PAH or more PAH than what is expected from the left heart? We used to use pulmonary vascular resistance, but we know that is not necessarily the most adequate one because it uses the transpulmonary gradient, and I'll show you why, which is the difference between your mean pulmonary arterial pressure minus your wedge pressure. Diastolic pulmonary gradient, the difference between your diastolic pulmonary arterial pressure and your pulmonary artery wedge pressure. Those are the three elements that are used generally for these particular reasons. So we go back to the patient that we had, and those are the right heart parameters, and you find how this patient does have a wedge of 23, so if we, uh, the, the, the transpulmonary gradient obviously is large because it's 50 minus 23. Normally it has to be 12 or so. The diastolic gradient is very large, 23 versus 38. So the patient does have significant elevation of both transpulmonary gradient and diastolic gradient. Obviously the PBR is elevated. So which one do you choose or which one is more reliable? So this is what the, it was shown, and I think I have shown this before in a prior lecture, the relationship between pulmonary arterial waste pressure <coughs> versus pulmonary artery pressure at different stroke volumes. And this is the example of a one-to-one -one transmission of pulmonary artery wedge pressure to diastolic pulmonary artery pressure. What tells me here is that the stroke volume variation in these patients affects systolic pressure and mean pulmonary artery pressure, but it does not affect diastolic pulmonary pressure. 
And when you look at the change in pressure in relationship to the wedge, your diastolic pulmonary gradient maintains a one-to-one -one relation compared to the trans pulmonary gradient that is variable depending on the stroke volume of the patient at any given time. And this is the rationale why we don't use this anymore because cardiac output has to do with stroke volume. So we use mostly the diastolic gradient that actually takes away the distension of the pulmonary vessel in the uh, circulation in general. So this is the kind of most accepted way, but this is all retrospective information, physiology data, very interesting, but they actually is in the process of being thought at trial prospectively to validate this because there was a recent paper in the in um, uh, Jack that showed that transpulmonary gradient is better. And you know the conclusion was you don't do the procedure well. That's the bottom line. You don't know how to calculate this because you end up getting wedges that are abnormal. We just had two cases where the wedges were tremendously high. And we saw that phenomenon from the wedge. You understand what that is, right? That you put the pulmonary artery catheter with the balloon inflated, but they are both so distal in the pulmonary circulation because they have so much pulmonary hypertension that they are afraid to go all the way and wedge. So as soon as they see the drop in pressure, they stop and they say, okay, that's your wedge. But guess what? You still have a space between the balloon and the wall of the vessel. So some of the high pulmonary pressure that continuously pushes your catheter because the pressure is so high is recorded as wedge. And at the end of the day, it's pulmonary artery pressure. That's called under wedging and that happens a lot, particularly in the very severe cases. So that is the conclusion so far of that. So DPG or diastolic pulmonary gain is not influenced by stroke volume at any given level of wedge pressure, and that's the reason why it's used. So the definition of what are the limits for diastolic pulmonary gradient, this is a normal value, should not be different from your wedge. It's a one-to-one -one value, remember? We call it abnormal, particularly that gives you prognosis because this was studied when it's more than seven. You have pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension when it's more than 10 or considered to be pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension. So now it was defined that if you end up getting isolated post-capillary post pulmonary hypertension when you have a wedge more than 15 and your diastolic gradient less than seven, that belongs to this category. So this is all left heart disease. But combined disease, post-capillary and pre-capillary, when you have more than 15 or that you normalize your wedge pressure by your gradient continues to be elevated. This is what came out of knees. Still not in the paper. When you read the actual paper of that, they didn't decide to to compromise, to say this is something that you should treat. They just describe physiology. They are not telling you, you do have, because when they open those lungs in autopsies or in biopsies, you don't have PAH that I showed you before. You don't have all those changes. Then when you talk about what do I do with this patient, there have been trials already, many of them, uh, in heart failure with reduced injection fraction for different medications, we all see what the Dalafil, Sildenafil, in, with reduced ejection fraction, there are more newer trials that actually there were most of the time they do not meet uh, the primary endpoints. In these three trials, none of them actually met the primary point. In that Sildenafil trial, the one that was done uh, in 2007, there was one trial only, circulation continues to be the only trial that shows that there was improvement in VO2 max in this case because they use cardiopulmonary exercise testing and hemodynamics, and they used 20 milligrams of sildenafil three times a day up to 75. So it was, there were only 40 patients. Again, cardiologists hang on to that one. It's not necessarily the truth. We don't know more because extension of those trials do not really show that necessarily. When you talk about how failure with preserve ejection fraction, failed to reach the endpoints as well for the use of Riosiwat and sildenafil in the relaxed study. Again, this was not for pulmonary hypertension, it was mostly for the disease process itself. So there is no evidence supporting the role of PAH drugs in the context of pulmonary hypertension and left heart failure. Although a subset of patients may benefit from PDA5 inhibition in a specific context, the off-label use of PAH therapy in left heart failure is a matter of concern. It's used indiscriminately. Patients should be included in randomized control trials, something underway or complete. Quickly about group three. So we have a case like Mike describes, 74 year old man with COPD for 15 years. These are the F1 numbers, 70% predicted, ratio 53, DLCO 25% predicted on appropriate therapies, worsening dyspnea, neuro association functional class three, voice code five. Physical exam as described there, it's hypoxemic on two liters. 
JVD of 12 centimeters with normal breathing sounds, a slight pre prolonged respiratory phase, and no accessory muscle used to improve. There was hepatomegaly with uh, three centimeters below the costal margin and edema in lower extremity. That would be an example of that spirometry. And this is a CT scan uh, of the upper portion of the lungs. I think I have to, you know already that there is some evidence of emphysema in this CT scan, and you get this right heart cat value. So you have a right ratio of five, mean pulmonary artery pressure of 47, a wedge of eight, and a cardiac caput and a cardiac index five and two. So what would be the best answer? It's unlikely this patient will die from RV failure. He has IPAH in combination with COPD and should be treated with pulmonary vasodilators. Pulmonary vasodilators are safe on this type of patients when prescribed. His likelihood to receive lung transplantation immediately is very high. This patient belongs to a subgroup of COPD patients with moderate COPD and very high pulmonary pressures that negatively impact his outcome. Who wants to roll You want to take that one? The last one. The last one. The longer answer usually is the so, what about this, Rodel? What do you think? I think you know the the the, the diastolic rate is so high, but he's a uh, CPP. Oh, this is COPD. Forget about that. Yeah. That's for heart failure. No, I was looking at the function of the RV. Uh -huh. It seems that the RV pressure looks okay, so he's probably okay for now. But I, you know, you should be followed. Okay. Yeah. So let me tell you, <laughs> you are completely correct. You should, he should be followed. <laughs> but I can tell you something. This patient probably is not going to die from COPD. This is not the patient that is going to get to the hospital with respiratory failure and die in the ventilator or close to patient. This is a, these are the type of patients that are going to die from die from RV failure. They do have higher mortality. He has IPH in combination with COPD. This is compromising. You cannot say that because you already know that this patient has COPD. You have radiographic emphysema. So by definition, that patient has COPD and the patient has pulmonary hypertension due to that. That's what you have to say, okay? Pulmonary vasodilators are safe when this type of patient will be prescribed? The answer is no, they are not safe. These patients can have a worse VQ this much, right? I mean, they could, you could increase perfusion to areas that are not ventilated. So you, in theory, and demonstrated that these patients do become more hypoxemic. Not the same for IPF, but for COPD, well known. His livelihood to receive lung transplantation immediately is very high, Rodeo. You are in transplant. What do you think? No, his LAS score would be low because the, I think the LAS score is underestimating the, the, the right-sided pressures. And actually, they have to write a waiver form especially if the cardiac index is below less than 1.8 and the CBP is more than 15. So, he has a body score of 5, he has, uh, sorry, he has a 70% breakage of CB1. Do you think he ever going to get a transplant? No. No. He will not have, besides, look at the size of the guy. So, it will never happen either. But you know, this is another example. I mean, this is severe. This is this is not a joke of uh, pulmonary hypertension. This guy has CBC. So these patients are disadvantaged as well because he will die from RV failure, and that is not considered the LAS score. And that will actually is considered to be updated because of this potential reason. He doesn't meet the criteria for the waiver because his cardiac output or index is not that low. The right atrial pressure is not more than 15. But you know he will advance. By the time that he advances, he won't have time. So these patients usually are disadvantaged. So that is the answer. <laughs> So with, with this FED1 of 70, mm -hmm. so it stages out proportion, but it's not that, that so that would that. you, would you, I mean, the rest of treatment at this point, what would you do? I mean, I'll show you in a second. And just the, uh, we have like five minutes to discuss that. But you know, what is the clinical relevance of pH in COPD? And this is just a not very popular study, but from 2005, they showed that depending on the degree of pulmonary pressure that you have, you definitely have uh, a cumulative survival that is less than if you don't have pulmonary hypertension. So again, this has been demonstrated over and over. So they do worse. As I said, anything you could pH makes people worse. So why does it happen? A smoke exposure, parenchymal destruction, hypoxia reperfusion, airway obstruction and hyperinflation, DQ mismatch, 
you get into pulmonary vasoconstriction, you get all the oxidative stress and arterial dysfunction, inflammation that happens in patients with COPD. You end up getting pulmonary vascular remodeling, some RVH and diastolic dysfunction of the right ventricle, and then you end up with systolic dysfunction. Of course, there are some other factors that, like I told you, epigenetic factors in this patient, because what? I didn't put a slide for this. About 50% of patients with COPD will have pulmonary hypertension. The great majority are gonna have pulmonary hypertension that is mild. And it's gonna be pulmonary pressures that usually do not translate into a clinical syndrome of the right ventricular failure. It has been now described that only about four to 5% of patients with COPD will develop what it is end stage right ventricular disease. So the great majority would stay in the mild category rather than the bad one. So you are gonna have a structure sleep apnea, intercellular disease, and if you combine, combine pulmonary fibrosis and emphysema, the prognosis absolutely worsens. They have heart disease, obesity, all that comes in the pathophysiology of why this happens. So there are many factors. So you can work on fixing some of this, but at the end of the day, your COPD treatment for that patient for COPD, COPD is not the major problem for this patient. What's the beginning of the problem and trigger some of the unclear things that are happening on this patient that we don't know yet. With IPF, the same story. This is a, a Danish study uh, that showed that by echocardiography, you can see a clear difference in survival in patients with IPF with pulmonary hypertension versus not pulmonary hypertension, and this goes all the way up to three years. Very marked difference. I think Krishna and everybody who sees ILD notices that pulmonary hypertension certainly is a curse for these particular patients. So there was a suggested screening algorithm for pulmonary hypertension in parietal lung disease. This is from Steve Nathan in the Clinic of Chest Medicine, uh, but it's not then validated. So again, this is something that could be used. So patients with persistent or out of proportion dyspnea to the ILD, again, lots of subjectivity, less objectivity. So you wanna make sure these patients do not have a complication with pulmonary embolism. If you find in your PFTs, you have a DLCO that is low, but your relationship to your FDC is more than 1.5, you have to suspect that there is a problem. Why? Because these patients have a diffusion lower than the, in the, the decrement in the FDC. That is known. Six minute walk distance, if you desaturate during room air, if the distance decreases, and if you have a pulse rate recovery less than 13, this is something that we don't use, that will be very nice if we can do it. It has been demonstrated in patients with pulmonary hypertension do have an increment pulse rate recovery. Normally you are supposed to bring down your heart rate within the first minute after your six minute walk test below 13 beats. I mean, 13 beats less than what you are walking. So that is, again, you need to train the people for that, but that's another parameter I can tell you. This patient could potentially have some cardiovascular abnormalities, not specific for that only because heart failure will be the same. Supporting your evidence, say so you have a BMP, then you can actually think of doing an echocardiogram if you find this consider right heart cap. Why? Because again, that can actually push you to get this patient for transplant or to be more aggressive for experimentation of oxygen. But in theory, again, this is not then validated. We're just trying to grasp some objectivity to see when to do something else. This is what you should never do when you do a presentation, okay, in general. But I just wanted to show you here, these are all trials that I was able to pick up in by patients with different disease, but they are interstitial lung disease. Pulmonary fibrosis, IPF, biopsy proven, IPF, IPF, IPF. And what happens here, outcomes, all of them did not meet the end criteria. So there is an option here, here to tell you that for pulmonary fibrosis, treatments with pulmonary bioglassal dilators do not work. The only one that looks a little better is my Lang Han from the University of Michigan that took patients from the STEP IPF trial and look post hoc analysis and they found that there was, there was an improved preservation of the six minute walk distance and the echo didn't go as bad. Again, they pulled data out of a study that showed in general- It's only in patients with RV dysfunction. And RV dysfunction, correct. So these patients, again, were looking at echo with RV dysfunction. So this is a very selected group of patients so you cannot really translate this into a prospective data or set of information. Now when you're saying improved preservation, is it like the IPF trials that they're still getting worse, just not as bad as the other group? It's not as bad yeah, as the okay. <laughs> Yes, it's basically that's what it is. Improved preservation is uh, a, a kind of game of words. Um, so this is what Mike was talking about on your question about what do you do without a proportion. This came out of Nice 
This wasn't published like this in the paper in Jack. They just showed us there. This is what the community in PH says. This is not what the rest of the population says. So this is what was disclosed, and they say, okay, if you have a phenotype with an FE1 less than 60%, or IPF with less than 70%, and you have pulmonary pressure mean between 25 and 35, no data to support treatment because it's mild. If it's more than 35, refer to center with expertise, trial, randomized controlled trial theory, potential use as bridge to transplant if you are severe. But this is the problem. FE1 more than 60%, FEC more than 70%, no gross parenchymal abnormalities in CT scan. What is that? Nobody knows. It's very subjective. IPAH is too mild. IPAH, PAH treatment may apply. This is very, very bothersome to me because you know this is what PH specialists saw. And a lot of these patients get treated for this reason. Now, in terms of the second group, trying to figure out when you're seeing a patient like this whether to think about PH, would a CT showing no gross parenchymal, you know, and the COPD, if he's one with a period of 60, would you find the DLCO important to trigger the need to get echo to DLCO of that proportion? Yeah, or no, absolutely. Without gross emphysema, that would suggest. It could suggest, but at the end of the day. Um, or not. Do you guys use the DLCO as a way of that we take, we, we put, we, we take it into account. We definitely take it into account, but it, it still doesn't define for us who it's going to get treated. And this is confusing. I don't, I don't have a good answer for you because that doesn't exist. So they say meets criteria for IPAH. At the publication level, they didn't put this. They didn't dare to say this. Because what it's telling me, if you have severe pulmonary hypertension, you treat this patient. And it's not real because these patients could get worse and the IPF don't get any better because some of those patients were also included in the trial. Again, it's, I have to show you this because this is what happens. So if we think about statistics, PAH happens in 15 per million. So in the US, we will have about 4,500 patients. Idiopathic, one to two per million, 300 to 600 patients, that's what we are supposed to have. Prevalence of COPD, severe PAH in 4%, 600,000 patients with that problem. Prevalence of heart failure with a PAH in 50% of them, two million and a half patients with that. Pulmonary fibrosis, Grossly, 128,000 patients, PH in 60%, 77,000 patients with that. DPE, DVT, we didn't talk about that. Chronic thrombolytic disease in 4%. We have this number of patients circulating with that problem. So we are definitely doing it wrong, right? I mean, we are getting these patients who need therapy, who need something not looked at because we don't understand them. I just want to tell you, this is what we see, not what I showed you before, for the most part. So we're looking again at the tip of the iceberg now. And research is very important. They are we're doing pulmonary angioplasty now to try to open this. Or a prostacyclin analogs, the Griffon trial ended. It hasn't been published. It's going to be presented this week. The results in the American College of Cardiology, the, uh, the oral medication, that it actually showed that it improved mortality. Presynchronization therapy, stem cell therapy, big failure so far. Pharmacogenomics is still on the go. Our failure is ahead of us on that. The use of ambulatory nitric oxide has been falling out of uh, popularity. It's not really working well. Very complicated. Implantable prostacycline pumps, it was actually going very well, but it turns out that one of these pumps malfunctioned in a patient with pain medicine for a different purpose, the same pump, and it just decided to be withdrawn and not to be used anymore. And driver assist device, among many other potential <coughs> things that could be done. So incise into pathobiological disease, particularly in non-group one, are quite necessary. Diagnostic accuracy is essential. Will demonstrate better, treat, better treatment effects. Evolution of treatment choices as well their delivery in the refinement. Emphasis in global disease burden with secondary pH is important and the fund allocation. Pharmaceutical companies don't give money for that because they know it doesn't work. Great advancements that we cannot be considered to be satisfied with this. 